the presentation with you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Cool. Can everybody see the screen here? Yep. So the presentation that we're going to do today is the level up your life. And this is, how's the sound real quick too? Does everybody hear me? Okay. Thumbs up. Yep. Oh yeah. Gotcha. Sounds good. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. So let's get into it. I want to start with a really interesting story that I think is relevant right now because of what everybody's facing with COVID. Also because I'm a degenerate poker player, but the story is that of Jack Treetop Strauss. And the saying is a chip in a chair. <clears throat> if you are a gambler or you play poker, you'll have heard the story of chip in the chair, but you might not know the origin of it. It actually comes from the 1986 World Series of Poker. And Jack Treetop Strauss was sitting at a table. He made a bet. He pushed uh, what he thought was all of his chips into the center. His opponent called. He lost that hand, got up to leave. As he was leaving, somebody pointed out that there was one $500 chip that was stuck under the bumper by his seat. So Jack sat back down. He doubled up over and over again and ended up winning the 1986 World Series of Poker. Now, a lot of people think that <clears throat> that's just luck, right? Unsurmountable odds. It'll never happen again. So I want you to gander at this number right now. One in 400 trillion is what science says is the current probability that you exist, that you have a life. And this number is only factoring in once your mom and dad conceived a child that it was you. This is based on the number of sperm times the number of eggs that your parents had. This doesn't factor in there were 6 billion people on this planet that had to come together. This doesn't even factor in the generations that had to happen or whatever your particular spiritual belief is. So if you think that, you know, doubling up a couple times and overcoming insurmountable odds uh, is something that's unachievable, just the fact that you're sitting on this presentation, the odds are one in 400 trillion. Now, knowing that, think about this. What if you knew that your last day on earth, the person that you became will meet the person that you could have become? Pretty scary, right? Could be scary. I would like when I get to my last day on earth to not be this guy staring at somebody that could have changed the world, right? So the idea of this workshop is that we're all going to work smarter, not harder. We're going to find our why, and we are going to continuously work towards being the best version of ourself. I want to start with a uh, Japanese word. It's one of my favorite words, ikigai. Ikigai is a concept of uh, finding your profession at the center of what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for. And a lot of people live in one or maybe two or three of these circles, right? Like my agency, Zen Man, it's, uh, it's a profession. It's what I'm good at and what I can be paid for, maybe a vocation. Some people have passions or even a mission, right? Maybe somebody in the uh, cleric or uh, a missionary, that would be a mission. But it is possible to find what you love and what you're good at and that you can be paid for. There's uh, an island that most of you know, Okinawa off Japan from the Karate Kid, right? We know Daniel Sun and bonsai trees. But what's really special about Okinawa is they actually have more centurions, more people that live to be over 100 years old than anywhere else on the planet. And they attribute that directly to Okinawans finding and living their ikigai. And when you find your ikigai, you're not looking forward to, you know, retiring at 60 and then, you know, tending to the garden, you are going to be living this for the rest of your life. And that's what makes the ikigai concept so powerful. We have something a little similar to this here in the uh, West, which is your why. Simon Sinek made Start With Why very famous. And most businesses have a why clearly defined, but few individuals define their why or their ikigai. And there's a very simple formula that you can put together when you're working on your personal why statement. And that is two, and then the blank is the contribution that you make so that second blank impact on the world. And to give you an example, my why is through science, spirituality, and generosity to help others be the best version of themselves. So I'm, I'm Buddhist. I humbly like to think that I'm a bodhisattva. That's somebody who's uh, this incarnation is meant to enlighten others, not myself. And so that is how I found my why. Uh, it's not something that I jotted down on a piece of paper, you know, after a half an hour. This might be what you work on for the next 90 days or maybe even personally for the next year to really try to figure out what, what is your why? What is your icky guy? 
And if you're struggling with this, many of us that have had businesses or careers, especially those that have been successful, our ego gets involved and we try to see our personal why through the lens of our career or our work experience or our business if you're an entrepreneur. So try to look at, at your why. What would you do? Why would you spend your time if you didn't need money? Now, I created this product, The Oak Journal. I am a huge advocate of writing versus digital. I am a digital native, um, but there are some facts as to why writing something down makes an enormous difference. Two stats that I'll give you. One, by writing something down, you double your probability of accomplishing it. So whether that's a bucket list item or it's just a simple to-do list for the day, the act of writing something down doubles your probability of accomplishing it. And second, there's emotion that's transferred when we put pen to paper. If you don't believe me, if you have kids or you know somebody with kids, look at the you know uh, art that their children have made that they save. I have framed line drawings, stick figure drawings that my kids made of camping trips that we took together, not because it's a priceless piece of art, but because there was love that was transferred when they put that crayon or pencil or marker to paper. And I wanted to save that, I could actually feel that. That can work the opposite way as well. If there's somebody that's wronged you in business or your personal life, there's a really great exercise I learned by the uh, Hindu monk, Dandiapani. That is, you write a letter to the person that harmed you. You put all the emotion out, use profanity, whatever you want to say on this letter. And then after you've written that letter, you burn it. You wait one week and you write that same letter. And over the course of about one to two months, depending on the aggression, um, you're going to see your shift is going to change. You're going to shift from anger to empathy. The final letter that you write to this person won't be that of, you know, you're, you're so horrible. I can't believe you're such a narcissist and you stole from me. It's going to be from a place of sympathy where your letter will say, you know, I'm, I, I am so sorry that you were in a situation that you had to make this decision that ended our friendship. It's a really, really powerful process. Um, important step though, you have to actually burn the page to get rid of that emotion. You actually need to see that paper go up in flames. Buddha says, holding on to anger is like holding a hot coal waiting to throw it at someone. Obviously, we're the one that gets hurt. To let go of that anger, really, really powerful exercise that you can do. The uh, next exercise that I want you to all do, and we're actually going to do this morning, take out a piece of paper. And if you were going to make 2021 the best year of your life, there are some things you need to start doing. And there's some things that you need to stop doing. Right. So on that page, I want you to write at the top, start and stop and write down at least one or two things you are going to change this year. What are you going to start doing? You want to get in, in shape or you're going to start running three days a week. You're going to start a yoga regimen. Uh, you want to maybe stop some self-destructive behavior. Stop watching so much news. We've all been obsessed with that for the past four years. Maybe there's a substance, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, pornography. There are things that you need to stop doing. And a pro tip here. If there was something that when I mentioned the start stop list, you were terrified to put on the stop list, that is 100% the most important thing that you need to stop doing. So a few things we all need to do, especially over this last year with the pandemic. Those three things are mindfulness, health, and that includes your diet and your movement and getting seven to eight hours of sleep. If anybody's having uh, trouble sleeping, we can talk about a couple techniques after the presentation in the q and I can give you a couple of hacks there like box breathing that will help you get to sleep. We're gonna talk about mindfulness if you don't have it. And your health and diet is really important. It's very easy to be um, not moving right now, to just be sitting in our chair for all day for you know, 10, 12, 14 hours at a time. And it's also easy to not be intentional with what we're putting in our body. Think of what you put in your body as fuel, not food. We're gonna start our day by not doing this. So uh, when I do in-person workshops, I have everybody raise their hand. How many people start or end your day like this? And it's always 90% of the audience. Uh, the reason that I use this particular stock image is the blue light. So there's two reasons we want to stop doing this. The first is in the evening, that blue light that your device emits, and that could be your cell phone, your tablet, your television, your laptop. It emits a blue light that inhibits our brain's ability to release melatonin, which we naturally need in the circadian rhythm to fall asleep. So by looking at a device while you're in bed, you are actually stopping your brain from being able to go to sleep. Also, 
this Netflix and chill saying is not actually true. When our brain is looking at a screen, it is processing millions of pixels at once and it is actually stressful to our mind. So it's keeping us awake. So when you're watching TV, you are having the opposite effect. Uh, thirdly, what we're putting in our brain, the last 10 minutes we're awake and the first 10 minutes when we wake up, your brain is like a, a sponge. Your subconscious is a sponge. So we want to be very intentional with what we're putting in that sponge at that time. So the last thing we want to do is look at CNN, news, even social media right before we go to bed. And when you wake up in the morning, if you answer your phone or you look at your email and you're not a cardiothoracic or a neurosurgeon, we can probably wait 30 minutes to prime your body. And we're going to do that using a method I learned from one of my mentors, Warren Rustan. It's called the 10-10-10. It stands for 10 minutes of meditation and 10 minutes of reading, followed by 10 minutes of journaling. That 10 minutes of meditation is going to give us a greater sense of self-awareness, reduce our stress and anxiety while increasing all mental clarity and focus, and then finally triggering the brain's relaxation response. So we're reducing the cortisol in our brain. All of this is based on ancient wisdom and current neuroscience. Secondly, we're going to move into reading. This is going to help you retain information. If you read for just 10 minutes a day, you're going to read 20 books this year. Think about that. You're going to reduce your stress lower our risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, since we all are gonna find our ikigai and live to be 120 years old. I want my mind to keep up with my body. And then we're gonna to continue to alleviate anxiety and depression with reading. And then lastly, journaling, we're gonna start our day in a positive way. Warren Rustan advocates that you journal, uh, imagining that your grandchildren are gonna read these books, that this will be the legacy that you're gonna leave your kids. Also, there's a great book, The Artist's Way, I would recommend reading it. It talks about the benefit of untapped creativity by just two pages of free flow of consciousness. This is also going to help us be aligned with our tensions. And again, by writing something down, we double the probability of accomplishing it. It's going to improve focus and productivity. And lastly, stimulate creative thought. So start your day with 10, 10, 10. If you don't think you can start your day with 10, 10, 10, I'm going to share my morning routine with you and challenge you to just to wake up 30 minutes earlier. The whole point of this is not to put more on your plate. It is to sharpen the ax. Abraham Lincoln said that if you give me eight hours to chop down a tree, I will spend six hours sharpening my ax. And the point of this is not to put more on your plate to actually be more productive. People that don't meditate that say they don't have time for meditation are really, really missing out because meditation is by far the most uh, beneficial thing that's going to give you more time back in your day from just taking 10, 15 minutes. So this is how I start my day. Uh, I wake up at 4 a.m. I drink an 18 ounce glass of lemon water, make a pot of coffee, and then I do creative writing for an hour. I've been doing this hack for six months. I'm actually moving it up to 5.30. I'm adjusting this a little bit because I'm not a masochist. There was a reason I did this. This was for six months with the goal of writing a book. That was a bucket list item for me. It's something I've wanted to do for 25 years. I've started no less than a dozen times, and now I've completed one by having this ritual, these habits, and this discipline. So I wake up, I write for an hour. The reason that I decided to do this at 4 a.m. and not 9 a.m. or 4 p.m. is biohack. At 4 a.m., your brain is naturally in a state between alpha and theta brainwaves. Alpha brainwaves uh, are where our mind is at in a deep state of meditation. So an enlightened monk, uh, when he's meditating, his brain will be in alpha brainwaves. Theta brainwaves are where we're at when we're in the flow state. So when you get to that state of, of consciousness and focus where you can do the hardest tasks with ease, we are naturally in that state between four and five in the morning. So it just takes a little bit of discipline <clears throat> and character to wake up in the morning and do that. Then I meditate for 30 minutes. My 10 is a little more than an hour. I do 30 minutes of transcendental meditation. I read for 30 minutes because I, I, when I get into a book, I need to read for more than 10 minutes. Then I do my journaling, a little bit of yoga and movement, shower, eat breakfast, dress, make my bed. I spent another hour working on my book, and this is really just proofreading what I wrote that morning. Uh, at four, when you're in that little biohack state, you're in a very creative state, but not an analytical state. So I'm not the best at grammar at 4 a.m. Then the last hack I do is my 3210 email hack that I'll teach you. Character is the ability to carry out a good resolution long after the excitement of the moment has passed. Now that we are in March, 95% of people that set a New Year's resolution have already abandoned that commitment to themselves. What's more important to spend your time and effort on than yourself? So in the morning, when I didn't want to wake up, 
I would remember this quote, do I have character? And then if you need a little more boost, if you don't have confidence in yourself, make a public declaration. If you're going to do something, <clears throat> make a public statement, put it out on social media, share it with your close friends and your accountability partner and have them hold you accountable. I had a good friend in Melbourne that one or twice, once or twice a week, he would just FaceTime me at what would be 4.30 in the morning, my time, uh, you know, his late evening. And the point of that was just to check and see if I was keeping my commitment, if I was keeping my word, if I was being impeccable with my word. Now, this is not something that is uh, a superpower. Excellence is not a singular act, but a habit of what you repeatedly do. Character and willpower and discipline are muscles no different than anything else that can be built up over time. There's an exercise in building willpower and discipline from an admiral who gave an amazing commencement speech as well as a book, Make My Bed. And we're going to start with his task, why Marines make their bed every morning. Start your day with a win. It gives you momentum that you can build on. It is a great way to start your day. It's been used in the military for decades, and we are going to do this for the next 30 days. But when you do the simple task of making your bed, I want you to imagine it in three steps. One, finish that which you begin. Two, finish it well beyond your expectations, no matter how long it takes. And three, do a little bit more than you think you're able to. And if you apply these three principles to this simple task, and then moving forward throughout your day, whether it's responding to an email, writing a proposal, working on a project, or creating a piece of art, finish it, finish it well beyond your expectations, and do a little more than you think you are. This is a superpower. If you can do this, you will be able to build on it on everything that you do, not just that day, that week, that month, that year, but your entire life. Now, we don't wanna just be rowing the boat in a bunch of different directions. We have our why, and for the next 90 days, we're gonna set intentional, smart goals. And these are balanced goals. We wanna set one personal, one business, and one family goal for the next 90 days. And we wanna make them specific, measurable, attainable, time-bound, and relevant. And with these goals, we wanna be really specific. So we wanna state the goal, what is it you want to accomplish and be as clear as possible. And then I want you to come up with what are the tasks, milestones, maybe there's some resources that you need to accomplish this goal. And then the last thing, and this is actually the most important step is the expected outcome. I want you to really visualize achieving this goal and how it's going to feel. And it is mind boggling in 90 days, what somebody can accomplish. The reason that we chose 90 days is also based on science. <clears throat> As humans, we have about a three month attention span, anything longer than that, and we are gonna lose focus. We've got that squirrel syndrome, we get distracted. Most entrepreneurs have a much shorter attention span. So it's important to try to knock things out quickly. Don't treat this like your uh, you know, thesis paper and you're waiting to the last week and you're gonna crunch and do it all, you're not gonna do your best work. You're gonna get it done because of the adrenaline that's flooding through your body because you don't wanna miss the deadline, but you're fooling yourself if you think that you do your best work late at night and when it's in crunch time. You don't, you get a flood of adrenaline and that's your brain tricking you to make you think that you do a better job then, but it, it's not true. And I, I was uh, personally somebody that thought that for a couple of decades. What's possible if you set 90 day goals and follow this structure is truly anything. Uh, the goal that I shared here, I wanted to do stand up comedy. I had a chance to do it when I was 20 years old and I chickened out and I got a chance to do a do over. I spent 90 days working on a set. And after that, I actually did uh, 15 minutes at Caroline's on Broadway in Times Square in New York City. So you can accomplish anything. If I can stand up <clears throat> and make people laugh, at Caroline's, you can write a book, you can get in shape, you can start a business. Anything is possible if you follow this structure. What makes it possible is making continuous progress. So I've got a daily structure in the Oak Journal that's been designed around neuroscience to make you as creative, happy, and productive as possible. You can start any day, so the journal doesn't need to start on January 1st or the beginning of a quarter, it you know, starts today. You circle the day of the week, you write down the three things that you're grateful for. This is a neuroscience hack that's gonna help you elevate your serotonin. So by stating what you're grateful for, you wanna be as specific as possible and you also don't wanna repeat something. So my, healthy, my family's healthy, that's great one day, but if you repeat that over and over again, you're gonna have diminishing return on uh, the benefit of that. 
So state your three things you're grateful for. Don't repeat them and then be as specific as possible. There's one that I put on there. My second one was I was grateful for camping with my youngest son, Quinn, at the Crystal Mill. I put the Crystal Mill in there because I think it's the most beautiful place in Colorado. It makes me think about the actual location. And then I put in parentheses stargazing because when we were looking up at the stars in our sleeping bags, my little man said, uh, Dad, this is the best moment of my life. So that like even just stating that over and over again, I get this flood of oxytocin. I feel the love. Uh, and that's the benefit of doing that. We are hacking happiness. We're hacking the neuroscience by doing these simple tasks. Then we want to cast your vision for the day. This is something that I took from uh, Ben Franklin again. Before he started every day, he would ask himself one question. What good shall I do this day? So start your day by setting your intention for the day before you put your feet on the floor. So my intention for the day was give a pre presentation today that's so good it changes the trajectory of someone's life in a positive way, even if it's only one person. I want to change that someone for the better. So I hope that someone is on this call. Then I cast my three most important things. Now your MITs need to align with the three 90-day goals that you set. If you are working on, you know, if I see pick up the kids, give my oil change, uh, things like that, those are not your most important things that align with your 90 day goals. If one of your 90 day goals was to write a novel, there needs to be something that you're doing every day to make progress on your book on this. If it's to get in shape, what is it about your diet or physical activity that you're doing? Your MITs align with your goals. Now your today, your glance, that's your to-do list. Most people's to-do lists don't get to done because we don't give ourselves time the day to actually accomplish these tasks. So with the today at a glance, I want you to just reiterate your calendar, but instead of doing a task as a to-do list, if it takes more than two minutes, I want you to actually give yourself the time on your calendar to do it. If a task takes less than two minutes, just do that task now. Science shows us that it actually takes more time if you were to stop, come back and revisit it to get up to speed, to read it. It's gonna take you more time than to just do it then. So a really, really good hack to get you more productive. If it takes less than two minutes, just do it now. And then up at the top right there, there's a few things, the 10, 10, 10, morning routine, evening routine, tracking habits. These are little boxes that you check that'll give you dopamine. So instead of getting dopamine from scrolling through social media, you actually get a little bit of it every time you scroll on your phone through Instagram or Facebook, you can check a box for accomplishing something and that's gonna give you that same neuroscience. Gratitude is essential. I am going to share a video by brother David Stein uh, about the benefits of starting and just ending your day with gratitude, bookending your day with gratitude. Um, a lot of people right now share challenges that they're facing. They've lost businesses. My revenue went to 0%. I lost my home. Uh, even having lost you know, family members right now, we've got half a million families, over half a million families that have tragically lost loved ones in this last year. Uh, when you're thinking about your gratitude, think about that there are 11% of the people on this planet that will never have or currently don't have access to electricity. There are 17% of this planet, over a billion people that today don't have access to clean drinking water. So sometimes it's hard when we're struggling, but I guarantee you there is somebody right now in a hospital bed willing to chop off their left arm to trade problems with our problems right now. The importance of daily progress. So the reason why those MITs need to align with your goals can best be um, articulated through a story. And that story was the expedition for the South Pole. And there were actually two expeditions that set out at the South time. The first was a Norwegian expedition led by Raoul Amundsen, And the second was a British expedition led by Robert Falcon Scott. And for all intents and purposes, these expeditions were equipped equally. They set off at the same time but they had one main difference in their methodology, and that was the Norwegians' uh, 20 mile march. No matter what the conditions were, no matter how poor, uh, you know, blizzard, whatever was going on outside, they would pack up their base camp and they would try to make 20 miles, uh, 20 mile march towards the South Pole. Now, many times they made it much, much less than that based on the conditions, but the British had a different mindset they would hunker down when conditions were poor and try to wait for the ideal circumstances to be able to make enormous progress. And inevitably what ended up happening is not only the Norwegians reached the South Pole three and a half weeks prior to the British, but the British actually tragically perished on the return from the South Pole. 
So uh, for them, it was a matter of life and death. For you, it's a matter of living your best life, reaching your potential. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Compare yourself to your potential. The way that you can reach that potential to jumpstart it is by having an accountability partner. So pick somebody in this group, and then every day for the next 30 days, I want you to share with them, what are the three things that you're grateful for this morning? What is your vision for the day? And what are your three MITs? And that stands again for most important things. And what are the things that you're going to accomplish today? And just write that down. If you have no journal, that's great. Put it in the journal. If not, you can put it in a moleskin, piece of paper, back of a napkin. But write down the three things you're grateful for, your vision for the day, and your three most important tasks you're going to accomplish. And share that with your accountability partner for 30 days. You will be blown away by what you accomplish. It is really sad as humans that it's much easier to let ourselves down than it is to let somebody else down. So if I'm going to go for a run in the morning, but it's a little rainy or it's cold, it's easy to just curl back in bed and go to sleep. But if I'm meeting Jonathan to play squash, I have a commitment to another human. I am much more likely that I'm going to get out of bed, face that cold, get down to the club and play some squash. So having an accountability partner is a hack to help you accomplish your goals. And then at the end of every week, this is something I cribbed from agile software development. You need to be looking at the progress you made. So look at what are the three things that we're doing. And these were, these are the three that I'm currently working on. We had a Kickstarter launch. Uh, I'm working on a book and 90 days of health. So what's the progress that I've made this far into it. And I shade that on a scale of one to hundred. This gives me insight as to how much work is left to complete these goals. And a little uh, trick here too. In the last 10%, so if you think you're 90% done, 60% of the work is probably that last 10%. So knock this out early. Don't wait till the end. Do exceptional work. And then take the time to plan. Create a roadmap over the next month, next week. What's it going to take to make sure that you move them forward, right? Obviously, my book has fallen behind as well as my 90 days of health. So I need to kick in on my morning workouts and I need to spend some serious hours on the manuscript. The next thing that we have is our habit tracker and our personal reflection. So habit tracking is how we are going to create new healthy habits or replace unhealthy habits with positive ones. So write down what your goal is, the number of times you want to do it, and then check a box. Again, given a little bit of dopamine. And then underneath that, I've got my reflection tracker. And I track myself personally, professionally, my productivity, how I'm feeling physically, and how I'm feeling mentally. And I track that on a scale of 1 to 10. And what happens here, another little biohack, by tracking something, you are going to naturally, if it's bad, if I'm you know, physically feeling a two, I'm going to change my behavior because now I'm mentally aware of how it's impacting me. And as this happens over time, it's going to have a compounding effect. So just tracking your own uh, habits as well as those five categories will continue to elevate them. Sometimes you're gonna, you know, you're gonna fall back, you're gonna have a bad day, uh, even a bad week. When that happens, let's say one day you don't pick up your journal or you eat like crap or you don't meet Jonathan to play squash, right? I want you to think of the 2X rule. So whether it's a positive or negative habit, it's okay to miss. Nobody's perfect. You miss a day of journaling. You go out to dinner and you have a beautiful tiramisu because it's uh, somebody's birthday. Awesome. Enjoy it. We're, we're human. We are not perfect. But don't go two consecutive days. So the next day, don't wolf down a dessert. Or if you pit, miss your journaling, make sure that you don't pass it up again. Make sure that you never go more than two, more than one day with either not having a habit or uh, doing a bad habit. 3210. So this is an email hack that I do. Most people use their inbox as a to-do list and it's incredibly unhealthy and it's not productive. I look at my email for 30 minutes, twice a day. I read every email only once and I get my inbox down to zero. Uh, again, I read 30 minutes, twice a day, so one hour. I read every email only once and I get it down to zero inbox. Now, this is something that's gonna take a little bit of time to get you there. If you've got a few thousand emails in your inbox, it's gonna take a lot of time, but you know, carve out a Saturday afternoon and just churn through them. If there is something that you can unsubscribe to, don't just delete it, unsubscribe to it so you don't have to delete it again. Like we talked about with that two minute hack, if there's something that you can respond to right away, respond to it, delete it or delegate it. And for those emails that don't fit into this window, there might be an email that I need to respond to that's going to take 30 minutes for me to respond to. What do I do there? I file this email into a folder and then I put time on my calendar 
to accomplish that task. So 3210 email, it is a hack that is going to change your life. All of this is based on neuroscience and controlling these four chemicals in your brain. Your serotonin, which is the joy, confidence, and inspiration. Oxytocin, which is the feeling of love. Dopamine, winning and rewards. And cortisol, which is fear, anxiety, and anger. Cortisol was a very, very important uh, chemical in our brain. It's the reason we all exist. The reason that that one in 400 trillion was even a possibility. Our ancestors, when the bushes uh, ruffled, uh, they ran away thinking that it might be a tiger, even though it's not a tiger. Uh, the people that, that didn't, that didn't have that cortisol elevated, they got eaten. They didn't exist. They don't have um, generations that exist. So the problem is, as we've evolved over the last few centuries, there's not life or death situations that we're facing every day. We're not potentially going to step on a cobra or get eaten by a tiger, but our monkey brain, that cortisol is still elevated when we miss a deadline or we don't win a, a proposal or we're stuck in rush hour traffic. And so we need to intentionally reduce that cortisol while elevating our serotonin and oxytocin. Most people live in an elevated state of dopamine and cortisol, and you can easily burn out, whether it's after weeks, months, or even decades. Some people can churn for a long time, but eventually you are gonna burn yourself out. So we need to reduce that cortisol, which meditation and journaling naturally does while elevating your serotonin and oxytocin. And then if you really want to, to get that cortisol down, we could take it to the next level and you can take some ice baths and practice uh, some breath work that this gentleman Wim Hof development. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with uh, this crazy Dutch guy, his name is Wim Hof. He, over the past couple of decades, developed this technique called the Wim Hof breath work. It is a combination of meditation, exposure to cold, and uh, uh, ancient Zen Buddhist breathing technique. And using this breath work, he can actually control his core body temperature. They've done experiments on Wim where they've stuck him in ice up to his neck for two hours and his core temperature won't drop even one tenth of one degree. He's also able to uh, eliminate illness. So his immune system through this exposure to cold and this breath work is boosted and he's able to fight off sickness. They have done studies with Wim where they take him and a group that he's taught this breath work to and injected them with influenza and other viruses and a control group. And Wim's, uh, the people that practice the Wim Hof breath work are actually able to, to fight off that virus and they don't succumb to that illness. Now, this is not a uh, replacement for social distancing or uh, wearing masks or anything like that in COVID or getting vaccinated, but this is something that I've, I've advocated and practiced for several years. I rarely get sick. Um, definitely check out Wim Hof. There's some amazing books on it, and I'm happy if you want to connect with me afterwards to teach you some Wim Hof breath work. Uh, I also am a big advocate of keeping you inspired and motivated. So in the Oak Journal, at the end of every week, we've got a positive psychology exercise to keep you motivated. There are two. Um, we're a little low on time, so I'll have you do these at your own leisure. But the first one is the four sevens. The four sevens is, I want you to imagine that seven years from today, you know that you are going to leave this earth. So write down a bullet list of all the things that you still want to accomplish in this life. What is left to be done? And then once you have that list created, I want you to imagine now you only have seven months left to live and then recast it. How are you going to spend your time? What's important to you? What needs to get done? What are your priorities? The third seven is seven weeks. So just less than two months. And then the final seven is seven days. And this uh, lesson was developed from lessons learned from uh, hospice care providers, people that were dealing with those of us that are transitioning off of this earth. And the insights that they learned from people that were facing the end of, of their life was not, you know, they didn't have a big enough boat or a new enough BMW, big enough house, all of the things that actually matter are time with loved ones, time with family, relationships. They're things that money can't buy. Time is the one finite resource that you have. Today is a gift and tomorrow is not a guarantee. So how you live every day is really the important part. Um, so with that in mind, 
the fun part because the four sevens is a little bit of a downer. It's hard. Some of you, when you do this exercise, you're going to see a huge change. In seven years, you're going to be write a book, sell a business. They're going to be potentially legacy goals. But when you get down to seven days, it's really the things that matter. It's, you know, have breakfast with my boys, my, my, make breakfast with my boys every morning, have, uh, you know, see the sunrise, make love with my partner. Uh, really things that we can be doing every day, even in the pandemic, are the things that we probably don't make uh, time to do. But the point of that exercise is to, to give you clarity as to what really matters when we still have hopefully years, decades left to, to enjoy it. And that being said, now I want to do the fun exercise, the bucket list. Uh, I mentioned a gentleman, Warren Rustan, earlier, a huge inspiration in my life. And when Warren created his bucket list, he was 13 years old. He wrote down 100 items that he's going to do. And he carries this bucket list with him uh, it, like an artifact from Rage of the Lost Ark. It's in a Ziploc bag. And he's checked off 98 of the 100 items on his bucket list. And the only two that he hasn't done, he wanted to be president of the United States. And he also wanted to see every country in the world. So he's not quite there. But he did 98 out of 100 because he carried that bucket list with him all of the time. He wrote it down. And another biohack I want to leave you with, we talked earlier about when you start your day and end your day, the last 10 minutes and the first 10 minutes are subconscious as a sponge. So after you write your bucket list and at least 25 items, if not 100 items, write the things you're going to do in this lifetime and then pick one of those items, put it on a three by five index card, tape that index card to the mirror in your bathroom. So it is the last thing you see when you brush your teeth before you go to sleep at night. And it is the first thing you see when you wake up in the morning. What is that next item that you are going to be working towards to live your best life? I want to leave you with this quote. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And I will open it up for questions now. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions for Keith? No. Nope. No questions at all. Well, so, yeah, so you mentioned sort of some of your history. Um, I'm wondering, you know, if you could spend just a couple minutes discussing the process of assembling the journal itself, and then what sort of feedback have you gotten from past customers for implementation? You know, what's the rate of fall off? Well, you know, what have you seen people struggle with? What have you struggled with? How does that, that sound? Okay. Uh, great question, Jonathan. Thanks. So the, the first one, how it created, I did a program at MIT five years ago called the Entrepreneur Masters Program. And this was really inspired by that. The, the keynote speakers, the, the people that I was surrounded by, I knew it was a life-changing opportunity and it was, it was what I wanted to take away from it. And the last speaker mentioned that 90% of us would implement less than 10% of what we learned. And that just seemed like an enormous uh, tragedy. So I left uh, and just got to work and I started bullet journaling. And for the first several years, it was actually just a tool for myself. I would create a blank journal and I would just go through an afternoon and create all this with a Sharpie. And then I started building prototypes and having people test it. And what I found was, even though I, I thought this was originally for, for entrepreneurs, for business owners, it was having um, life-changing effect on, on people outside of that circle. Uh, there's one user that's been using Oak for a year and a half and Jennifer um, actually read her bucket list. She lost over a hundred pounds because through the weekly retrospective exercise, she found that she was continuously disappointing her young daughter and not able to physically do the things that her daughter wanted to, to do with her. She couldn't participate because she wasn't healthy enough. So that, like we talked about, you know, tracking your happiness and everything every week, that actually changed her behavior. She's lost over 100 pounds. I've got a letter from Jennifer that she, she redid her bucket list because she could now do things in this life that she never thought she'd be able to accomplish. The biggest, so that's the biggest one for me that like I get goosebumps every time and like choke up when I think about Jennifer. The biggest challenge that people have is getting started, right? And that's the, ironically, the hardest and the easiest step. So if you've got the tool and you don't even need the journal, you just learned all of these, I'm horrible at you know selling stuff, but you just learned all the tools. You could write these down, you could practice them every day. Write them down, gratitude, MIT, set your goals, retrospective, right? Easy to do, you don't need the tool. But what I see a lot of people do, even friends that I've gifted the tool, they will wait, uh, one friend waited 18 months before he started it because he thought the journal was too pretty. 
your time is the finite resource. I have thousands and thousands of these journals. If you mess up a page, nobody is going to go back and audit your work. You can just cross it out, uh, delete it. You can even tear it out. So the getting started, that's the thing that people struggle with. And then again, give yourself, nobody's perfect, but that 2X rule, just have that character to, if you skip something, working out, being healthy, uh, make sure you don't go two consecutive days. So I'll, again, I'll ask the class, do you guys have any questions for him before I ask the next question? <laughs> no? uh, I have a question, but it's more yeah. of an off topic. Yeah. Um, it's more of a personal question, honestly. Um, do you play Hold'em, No Limit Hold'em, or um, Omaha? Uh, mostly No Limit Hold'em. Uh, what's your favorite hand? T favorite starting hand? Yeah. Uh, same as Daniel Legrano, 10-7 suited. Oh my God, he never leaves home without his tents. <laughs> yeah, I lose two more bases in King, man. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> H-King offsuit. Uh, painful hand. <laughs> yeah. Kick ass. Um, so let me sort of go backwards in time, which is what I thought Matthew was going to do. Um, I, so he, he picked up on the fact that you've got specific characteristics and traits. You know, you've got, uh, you, you gamble, you're a comedian, you obviously are an entrepreneur. What about individuals who are using this journal who are not entrepreneurial? I mean, what have you encountered you know, or, or have you tried to create something that somebody can sort of, sort of build a, what they consider to be a model life around and then sort of implement that and have people come back to you and said, well, you know, this actually doesn't work. You need to go back and rethink X, Y, and Z. And have you gotten feedback like, like that from customers? Oh, Jonathan, incredibly timely. I got a letter yesterday from a woman, an email, not a letter. Uh, she she sent me a message and the first message was, hey, your journal's for the 1%. You know, I saw your ad on Facebook and, you know, not all of us are delegating things. Some of us work three jobs and juggle kids. And so I said, you know what? I appreciate that. Let me send you. So I sent her a journal. Uh, any, anybody that can't afford a journal, I'm going to get them one. This is not about, you know, money comes, right? I make profit on the journals. But I sent um, Judith a journal. And oh, we have a Judith on the call. Her name was actually Judith as well. Sent Judith the journal and uh, she got it. And she replied, said, you know, I really appreciated that. So I want to expand on what I meant. You share an example in your journal about creating a new website. You have an area where people are delegating tasks. I am never going to delegate a task in my life. I work three jobs. I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to do all of these things. Um, so it hit home and I thought about it. I was like, you know, I can change the examples that I've put. And I replied to Judith and I said, okay, you know what? You're right. These are not the right examples for everybody. This was actually ironically a project that I was working on. It was, I think the current example is building a website, which I just happened to be doing at the time. So it was easy for me to just crib over what I was doing instead of thinking about a simpler task, like taking up painting as a hobby or, you know, losing 10 pounds, something that's not enormous and accomplishable. But then I also wanted to share with her, you know, she in her email felt deflated in that uh, some of us won't ever be able to accomplish our dreams and live our icky guy. And I, I told her that as much as I agreed with the, the journal being too much for the 1%, we're actually working on an acorn journal for kids. We're going to have a Tom's model where we give one away and I'll give anybody a PDF of the acorn journal to get in a kid's hand to help them right now. But I also shared with her the, sto the story of my mom. My mom grew up far below the poverty line. She grew up on a farm in rural Tennessee with stories of, you know, not having windows and waking up with snow on her blankets, being the one that had to make the hard decisions to what groceries when they didn't have enough money, what, you know, can we get milk or eggs, you know, for my brother and sister. And she worked her ass off. She raised two kids. She was married at 19 years old. I was born before my mom was 20. And she still managed to get her master's degree. She has top secret government clearance. She worked for multiple uh, in, you know, aerospace companies and does import export compliance is, is one of the most regarded people on the planet for this. Um, and it wasn't because she had an opportunity. It was because she had character. But I do think the most important thing that a lot of people are missing and, and the benefit that I had is I had that role model. You know, I had my mom to look up to and say, wow, this is somebody that showed me 
how I can better myself through hard work. And once I became a dad, I realized, man, none of that other shit matters. Gavin and Quinn, my son, setting them up for having it easier than I had it the same way my mom busted her ass. And also, you know, prioritizing them over anything else is uh, clarity I learned through it. Okay, guys, thank you very much. You know, um, sometimes I'm, you know, obviously I'd love to have our students ask some of these questions, but I'm afraid either they're afraid of their voice and, you know, literally the question they're going to ask. But also I think some people in, you know, this development of their life, they don't necessarily, uh, see the value of something like journaling. You know, you mentioned you acquired it at a specific point in time in your life. What do you think the characteristics were of the previous failures that necessitated doing something like journaling for, for you? Yeah, great question, Jonathan. And I would say this too, there are no, anybody that wants to ask a question, there are no bad questions. And if you don't wanna speak up, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll answer it, okay? Um, the reason that I journal is because it's real simple. I double the probability of accomplishing something. You want to start a business, you write it down you just double the probability of accomplishing it. You want to hike the Inca trail, the Machu Picchu, you want to, you know, walk across Spain and do the Camino, anything that you want to accomplish in this life. Think about how powerful that is. Just by writing it down, you double the probability of doing it. So that one thing for me, uh, that's a game changer. Knowing that fact, you now have the burden of knowledge, right? Um, knowing that just by writing something down, Matthew, you want to win the World Series of Poker in a PLO, you know, the, the main event, by writing it down, as crazy as it sounds, you've just doubled your probability of accomplishing it. You might not win, but if you write it down, amigo, you're probably going to sit at a table one day and play in it. And one of the greatest tragedies in life is that people don't aim too high and miss it's that they aim too low and hit. Yeah. And they're happy with it. That's, you know, hey, I hit that goal, you know, and absolutely. Yeah. And, and that being said, you don't have to, you know, I don't have the goal of having a billion dollar business. You don't have to be the next Elon Musk. You can live, uh, you can live your ikigai. You can live a happy life and be a barista. Uh, my partner, Mindy, that's her dream. I mean, she has a different business right now that's a staging interior design business that's much more profitable. But her icky guy, uh, I think if she had a coffee shop and she got to meet and create relationships with hundreds of people, that's her passion. That's what makes her happy. So, you know, she can't do it right now because we've got little ones at home. So she can't be at a coffee shop at six in the morning, right? She has other priorities that are more important um, than that. But I, I guarantee you when the boys go out, she's probably going to open a coffee shop and just be there you know, greeting everybody, remembering everybody's name, remembering Patty, which you order every day and creating those relationships because that's what fuels Mindy. Fantastic. No. So, yeah. Was somebody asked a question there? I thought, thought I saw some movement. I was like, <gasps> oh. Okay, well, I, will, okay, I think Kaylee's saying something. Hold on, Kaylee? Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Um. Part of, I think, with these kinds of journals and these kinds of um, planned uh, le levels to success or uh, going after goals, I feel very um, disappointed when they don't necessarily work out um, and feel like sometimes it can be a little bit of toxic positivity uh, where, you know, when I'm not making the headway that I want or uh, not uh, becoming happy with the results that I, I'm getting towards. It feels like uh, something that is built larger in my head and built larger in the journal that ends up coming to fruition. Is there a good way to go about protecting yourself from that kind of situation? Uh, yeah, setting, setting SMART goals. And that's that acronym I mentioned earlier, simple, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So if you like a good example, I've been working on my novel for 18 months. It has been one of my 90 day goals for 18 months It is not a 90 day goal. So break your big goals out into pebbles or smaller bites that you are going to accomplish and set yourself up for success. So for the first 90 days, let's start building some wins. So maybe for your personal goal, you're just going to really think about your why. 
Or maybe you're going to say, you know what, I want to meditate. I want to try this 10, 10, 10 thing. I'm going to do Keats 10, 10, 10, at least three days a week for the next 90 days. And that's it. Set that goal. And what you're going to see happen is, is, is you start to build momentum and wins on those small goals. You're going to be able to challenge yourself with larger goals. But the most important thing is setting, you know, realistic and attainable uh, goals so that you don't get that feeling of disappointment. And then when things happen, like 2021 was a pretty good example. Um, you know, a lot of people had aggressive goals in their businesses of their life. And 2021 really required a reset of, you know what, survival is is the goal. Like we just need to get by. If my business still exists in 2021 or 2022, then, then I'm going to be in a good place. Um, it's not about, you know, growing 10% or getting my EBITDA to, to 25%. It's about keeping employees or keeping people on. So yeah, smart goals. Um, I've got a video on that and I'll share, I'll send a recap uh, email to Jonathan and there's um, a video on, on setting smart goals. And then also just being kind with yourself. Um, if you don't reach those goals, don't beat yourself up, but I want you to be retrospective. Lastly, if you do that, Every week, if you look at how you're tracking on your goals over the 13 weeks, um, you, you are going to make consistent, continuous progress. Thank you. Oh, Jonathan, you're muted, sir. Look at that. I'm trying to be polite and it gets back at me. <laughs> um, uh, what does your website offer? So we're going to step away from this. You'll send me the recording of today's interaction, but you know, uh, you know, my fear of course, is that our, our honors program students are looking at this and they're thinking, well, we're trying to teach them how to think about something in one way. Um, when they actually approach your website and they do it of their own volition and they then take ownership of this, what will they encounter and what were your thought processes behind putting together the sort of the added material to keep people moving forward. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I think the thing that there's a lot of structured journals out there. I do think that this one's the best because I spent five years doing it. I'm biased. I looked at all of the journals out there and I did R and D um, rip off and duplicate all of the things that work. There's, you know, gratitude is in almost every exceptional journal, full focus planner, best self, five minute journal. You know, this is not something that was invented. This ancient wisdom has been, been practiced for, for millennia. But uh, on the website, the one biggest difference that we're trying to do as a business is accessibility. You know, as a, a bodhisattva, as a Buddhist, I, I genuinely want to help all of you. You can email me individual. I'll set up a Zoom. I'll have a conversation with you. I'll help you reach your goal. I'll be your accountability partner. Uh, so that's really the biggest difference on Oak is there is a ton of free resources, whether that's articles, eBooks, or videos to help you stay engaged, stay inspired, and stay motivated. Check us. Is there anybody else who have any other questions? Because I know Keith has to get on with his morning schedule. Sorry, uh, have, have you actually made your bed yet? Oh yeah, this first thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Cat sleeping on mine. Cat sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, two minute roll. If it, take, if it takes less than two minutes, just do it. Don't procrastinate. Yeah. Hang your jacket up. Don't put it on the back of the chair. Do you think making your bed made you more like disciplined? You know, created a thousand percent. Yeah. It's amazing if you get out of one of those habits, how easy it is for that to snowball into other uh, areas of your life where you can fall off the wagon. But it has the opposite effect too. By building on that small win, it gives you momentum through the day, through the week, month, and year. Yeah. And if anybody wants Admiral McRaven's uh, grad graduation speech, I can definitely send it along to, to you. I mean, being yeah, a SEAL awesome. is an important. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, that, that is rarefied air, right? But the pattern, the actual tool of doing that one thing every single day does actually change your life. Yeah, and his, his commencement speech, I mean, they talk about, you know, facing bullies. It's definitely worth the, the 10 minute watch. Um, awesome. You could probably watch that and not read his book, not to take away from his Amazon sales, uh, but the, just because the commencement speech is so good, I would highly recommend, I think his book is just called Make Your Bed, isn't it? Um, but uh, the, the speech is, is very powerful. Uh, quick question. Yes. Um, 
well, do you have enough time to go over the uh, the breathing exercises? Sure. Uh, so Wim Hof breath work is exposure to cold, meditation, and breathing. And what Wim Hof does is it's a really deep inhalation and then a full exhalation that's, that's intense all the way out. And you do that for 30 cycles. And then after the 30th exhalation, hold your breath as long as you can and do three cycles of that. And what happens, and then you can get in an ice bath. I do uh, meditation outside in the snow. I've got a little caribou hide that I sit on and then I'll, I'll sit outside in a snowstorm and meditate for 10 to 15 minutes. But that breathing will actually keep your core body temperature up. Um, and after you do those three cycles, you could do a polar plunge and whatever. And what's happening is you're not only flooding your, your whole system with adrenaline, you're actually closing off the, um, the nerves. So you're going to feel things less now, do not do that alone. Um, you, you absolutely could pass out and drown. Don't do it. If you um, want to start practicing the cold showers, which is a great way to start Wim Hof, actually sit down in the shower. Don't be standing in the shower when you do the breath work. Um, the first, and I think most powerful technique to test, Matthew, do push-ups like right after this call, do as many push-ups as you can, right? And then wait a minute, do three cycles of the Wim Hof breath work and then do push-ups again, you will probably do two X as many push-ups from just doing that breath work and flooding your system with oxygen. Uh, really, really powerful. Wim has a uh, website. There's a ton of books written on, uh, he's called the Iceman, but uh, you start with in his, in his workshop, you start with just putting your hand in a, in a bowl of ice water. So that's the first step. And, you know, anybody can do that. It's baby steps and getting into it. And even with the cold shower, you know, you don't have to step into the cold shower right away. You can take a normal hot shower, turn it down to medium, sit down, do your three cycles of your breaths, and then turn it to cold. And try to stay in for one minute to start. And if anybody wants to go for a dive in the ocean at any point in time, don't be afraid to ask me. I'll be more than glad to take you out and throw you in. <laughs> What's your opinion? Is that uh, uh, with or without collecting rocks first? <laughs> no rocks. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what was that, Matthew? Um, uh, Keith, what are your opinions on cold showers? Oh, excellent. I mean, just the ability, the discipline to do anything that's hard, right? Just like build, that is 10x better than making your bed. If you can start your day with a cold shower, uh, there are huge health benefits to it, like with the Wim Hof but also you're, you're building your character and you're building it at, an, at the next level. You've leveled up. Thank you. Well, I wanna respect Keith's time. So um, you know, if you guys have any other questions, now would be the time to ask them, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, he's gonna send us this recording and he's also offered, you know, so if you guys wanna reach out to him specifically, um, I'll make sure I get an email address to send along to you guys and keep the, the um, conversation going. So um, thank you very, very much. I'm hoping that obviously, you know, there's, there is a reason why they got this book. This book comes along, you know, the, the journal comes along with the fact that they're writing a capstone project. And I'm hoping that, you know, they're going to take this opportunity to learn, you know, what you've incorporated in and then think about the, you know, sort of the, of the big overarching questions of their research projects uh, to actually come to, um, you know, essentially, you know, the, the culmination and that feeling of success that comes from planning things properly. Awesome. Well, if anybody has any, is a, a, you know, an honor and a privilege to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to share Jonathan. And if anybody in the call wants to reach out, Jonathan, feel free to share uh, my email with them. And then Odin, really good job. Uh, going outside. There's also some movement you can do when you're doing your breath, sort of go, that'll help you if you're outside in the cold um, to just keep that temperature up before you get to that point where you're doing it naturally with just your breath work. Cool. Well, hey, thank you for the time. I'll get everything, uh, Jonathan, recorded. I'll upload it because it's going to be a big um, file. So I'll put it on YouTube if that's okay. Uh, and that'll send you a link directly to it. And I'll also share a PDF and a couple other videos with everybody. So, all right. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Have a great morning. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one.